Okay, everybody, welcome back. Here we are still in module nine. It's gonna be a long module. We still have a few different topics to cover. And here we're gonna be looking at yet another example of a single population mean two tail test. Once again, I have to keep saying this in normal circumstances, if you're writing an exam, you're doing an assignment, you probably don't have that information available to you. And so one of your first challenges is always figuring out what kind of test am I supposed to be doing? And so again, when you're going through the, the word, when you're going through the text of the problem, you need to be keeping an eye out for clues, for keywords, because that's where the information lies about what kind of test you should be doing. I've heard some students who, who will ask whether or not you can determine what kind of test you're, you're doing by looking at the sign of the test statistic. If it's a positive test statistic, upper tail test. If it's a negative test statistic, lower tail test. Well, what about a two-tailed test? It could be positive or it could be negative. That type of thinking is, is a little bit toxic because what you're doing when you're trying to formulate a test based on the results, you're, you're kind of going backwards from, you know, here's the results. And so based on those results, I'm going to see if I can show this. I want to see if these results give me evidence to show this. The proper process in hypothesis testing is to understand the problem. What is the question? What is the research question? What is the issue that we're dealing with? Then determine whether or not your, your sample provides evidence to support that claim or, or that assumption or, or to, to, to respond to that issue using the data. Don't create an issue from the data. Hopefully that makes sense. So here we've got this information that's telling us it's a two-tailed test. Normally we wouldn't have that information. So let's go through the problem and see what we can find. Okay, so we're looking at a farmer produces hay for nearby cattle ranchers. Uh, so the hay is rolled into 50 pound, 22 kilo bales and are sold by quantity. So if the, the rancher buys 100 bales of hay, they expect to receive 5,000 pounds of hay. So to ensure the ranchers are getting what they expect, the farmer periodically samples 40 hay bales. Okay, that sure sounds like a sample size to test whether or not they're averaging 50 pounds. Okay, that seems to be the value that we're testing against, right? That hypothesized value. The most recent batch gave us a sample weight of 51.2 pounds. There's my sample my sample mean. I have a population standard deviation here, 3.73. And we're going to do this test at the 05 level of significance to determine whether the farmer is producing what the ranchers are expecting. Now, when I read that sentence, use this level of significance to determine whether the farmer is producing what the ranchers are expecting. That sentence is really helpful, and it might not sound like it at first, but that sentence is really telling us what kind of test we should be doing. Because the, what are the ranchers expecting? The ranchers are expecting that each bale of hay weighs 50 pounds. So if we want to determine whether or not that expectation is being met, all that we are doing, it's not... Is it at least 50 pounds? Is it no more than 50 pounds? Is it less than 50 pounds? All we're testing to see is whether or not the average bale of hay is what is expected. And what is it that's expected? It's expected that they are 50 pounds on average, right? Because if they buy 100, oops, if they buy 100 bales, they expect to get 5,000 pounds. So, we're expecting those to be 50 pounds. And so we're performing this test to see if those expectations are being met. So uh, we've got our test formulated, again, to justify or to explain it. Once more, I always provide a, a, a translation of each statement, the null and the alternative. I say translation because 
you know, you really can think about much of what we've done here is, is learning a new language. That this here, what we see here, is two sentences using, you know, a different kind of vocabulary, different words, different symbols. But it's a sentence and it has meaning. And so when we're translating, when we're providing a justification, we're explaining it. What I want to be doing is really translating those statements into plain English so that anybody can understand how they relate back to the problem. How do they relate to the context of the issue? So I would say, if our evidence supports the null hypotheses, we have no reason to believe that the rancher's expectations aren't being met. If the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, well, now we have a problem because now we have evidence to show that the ranchers who are expecting the bale of hay to be 50 pounds, those expectations are not being met because our evidence shows that the average weight is not 50 pounds. Okay, so that gives me an explanation. I hope a plain explanation of both the null and the alternative hypotheses. The rest of this, again, it's all the same. Here we have our distribution when we assume HO is true. And so here we have that assumed value of 50. We draw a sample of 50. 51.2. Now we want to normalize that, standardize that, call it what you wish, and we use here again this same formula. Sigma root n. I'm going a little bit faster in this problem because I hope if you've seen the earlier videos, I started off going very slow, and now we're going a little bit quicker again because, my goodness, it's all very, very similar. I put in my sample values, 51.2 minus 50 over, here's that standard deviation, not a variance. One of our earlier problems that threw in a variance at us, so we had to make sure we accounted for that because what we want here is the standard deviation, and there I have 40 is the size of my sample. If I pull up my calculator, 51.2 minus 50 divided by 373 over root 40, so that gives me a test statistic of 2.03. Let's go like this. So that's out here somewhere. 2.03. So again, p-value approach, critical value approach. P-value approach, I look up my test statistic 2.03. We're still using the z-distribution. So here I'm going to scroll down to my z-tables. Now... It's positive 2.03. Do I want to use positive 2.03? Well, remember what we're doing here, this is a two-tailed test. I don't want to forget about that. It's a two-tailed test. So the value that I'm actually interested in is this value up here, that upper tail value. I'm going to take advantage of the symmetry of this distribution. Again, we've talked about that in earlier videos to know that this distribution is perfectly symmetric. So I'm going to take advantage of that and I'm going to look at the negative side. And so there's 2.03. And so that gives me this value of 0.02. So I'm going to come back up here. I have a probability here of 0 0.02. Is that my p-value? Be careful. Often it's the case, again, that students will just be in this routine. 
and you're looking for that probability that corresponds with your test statistic, and that's what you go with. This is a two-tailed test. Because it's a two-tailed test, we have to double that. So our p-value is 0 0.02 times 2, so it's actually 0 0.04. Now in this case, okay, it's a little inconsequential. Our level of significance here is 0.05. If we made that mistake and we forgot to double that probability, in this case, well, it wouldn't have really mattered. We would have rejected because the p-value at that 0 0.02 is less than 0 0.05, and then we would have interpreted the results. If I were marking that exam, if a student made that mistake, well, certainly you'd lose a mark because that's not your p-value. Luckily, it doesn't change your conclusion or the resulting interpretation, so you'd only lose a mark for that p-value. The correct p-value, because it's a two-tailed test, is 0 0.04. Now again, because doubling that p-value it still did not bring it above our level of significance. It's still less than 0 0.05. So if you make this mistake, you'll probably be okay. You'll probably just lose one mark if you're in my class. Luckily, it's not going to affect anything else. You'll still reject, which is what you would do if you had the correct p-value anyways. Imagine if, what if alpha was 0 0.03? Well, that changes everything because now this incorrect, this common mistake is going to lead you to reject the correct value given that level of significance. The correct value would lead to a totally different conclusion and therefore a different interpretation. So it's really important, again, to make sure that you pay attention to what kind of problem you're doing and make sure that everything is consistent with that. Sometimes you maybe will only lose a mark. Other times, if it results in the wrong conclusion and interpretation, you might end up losing a little bit more. Okay, so we have our p-value of 0 0.04. Based on that, I am going to reject my null hypotheses. Let's go ahead and use the critical value approach. So alpha is 0 0.05. I want these two critical values. I'm going to have one here and here. I already know that it's going to lie to the left of two because it's going to be consistent with my p-value approach, which means that critical value is going to be less than that test statistic. So if we come down to our Z tables, again, remember this is a two-tailed test. So my rejection region is on both sides of the distribution. I'm going to reject if it's too large or too small. If alpha is 0 0.05, the size of my rejection space is equal to 0 0.05. It's a two-tailed test, so that rejection space is split, it's divided on each side of the distribution, which means I want 0 0.025 here and 0 0.025 here. So what I want to look for in my table is the z-score that corresponds with an area of 0 0.025. It's symmetric, so I'm just going to look into the lower tail and here, scanning through, I can see there's my 0 0.025. So my critical value is plus and minus, because it's on both sides of the symmetric distribution, 1.96. So those are my values there, 196 and negative 196. So coming back up to my main problem here, negative 196 and 196. Once again, that defines that rejection space on both sides of the distribution. Here I can see 
My test statistic is larger than that upper tail critical value. That leads me to reject. Here I can also see that that critical value corresponds to an area in that upper tail of 0.025. My test statistic corresponds to a probability of 0 0.02. I find, again, I get a perfectly consistent result. My p-value is 0.04, which is double that. Alpha is 0.05, which of course was double that, because when we found those critical values, we divided it in half. So both of these are finding that I should be rejecting. Let's quickly go through and do the confidence interval approach. Now, this is the second time we've done this. We did one in an earlier video as well. So we'll go through a little bit more quickly this time. So again, remember that formula is that sample mean plus or minus that margin of error. So my sample mean here we have was 51.2. So this is going to be 51.2 plus or minus 1.96 times that standard error, which I have right here, 373 divided by root 40. And again, I'm going to do this in a couple of steps, just because it makes things a little bit simpler. But you can maybe do it in one step if you're more comfortable as well. I'm just going to calculate my margin of error first at 3.73 divided by root 40. And then I'm going to multiply that by 1.96. And so there's my margin of error. I believe it left so for soon. One point, uh, we'll round it to 1.16. Okay, so now I can get my upper limit plus 51.2, and so my upper limit there is 52, I think that was 39, 36. There we go. And then my lower limit, 51.2 minus that margin of error, 50.04. So, does this confirm our results? This is what we are wanting to do. Does it confirm uh, our, our findings? Now, when we did the test, both the critical value and the p-value approach led us to reject the null hypothesis, that we have sufficient evidence to show um, here that the mean is something other than 50. What does our confidence interval tell us? Well, the number 50 is just out here somewhere. It's really close. Very close. Doesn't matter. It's outside of that interval. So here, this is a 95% confidence interval, right? I'm 95% confident that the true population mean the, the true population average weight of a bale of hay is between 50.04 and 52.36. 95% confident it's between those two numbers. At that level of confidence, is it 50? No. Because 50 does not exist within that interval. It's very close. It's just right outside that interval doesn't matter. If it's not inside that interval, then that supports our conclusion to reject the null hypothesis because at that level of significance and therefore that level of confidence, 50 is not an option. So finally, interpret our results. Every approach all three approaches led us to reject the null hypothesis. 
we have evidence that there's a problem here. We have evidence to show that the average bale of hay is not 50 pounds. Therefore, the ranchers who are buying the hay, the ranchers are not getting exactly what it is they're expecting to get. Okay, so that's it. That's our two-tail test with the p-value, critical value, and a confidence interval to wrap it all up. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching, everyone.